Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Stonehouse in the UK and the home of the Arboricultural Association. My name's John Parker, Technical Director of the Association, and I'm very pleased that you've all been able to join us for this very exciting joint webinar event. It's an online extravaganza organised with our friends at the Urban Tree Festival. Please select all panellists and attendees when making your comments in the chat. Not just all panellists, otherwise not everyone will be able to see your wisdom. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing where you're all watching from. If you've got any questions for our speakers, then please put them in the Q&A panel and we will work through them at the end. This evening, we're delighted to be joined by two authors and tree people, Tracy Chevalier and John Drury. They'll be taking you on a journey through tree stories, exploring heart, mind and soul. We're very excited they're able to speak to us tonight and uh, I've really been looking forward to this one. So it's all very exciting. Next week, tragic news, next week we won't be having a webinar, so you can use your free time between 6pm and 8pm to watch one you've missed before, or watch one again that you've already watched, or learn a new skill, or whatever it is you'd like to do in your free time. We will be back the following week, though, and we're putting together a great programme of online content, which will be running all the way between now and our big event of the year, a face-to-face, in-person conference. Remember them? Yes. Hugging aloud. Uh, it'll be held at Loughborough University in September. So we hope we're going to see many of you there. For those who can't make it, there'll be a very special series of webinars through August to get you in the mood for the conference theme, which is Trees and Society. How's the Urban Tree World Cup going, John? I hear you cry. Well, I'm very glad you asked because it's been a humdinger. We're almost at the end of the first round now. Uh, we've seen some real action. My personal highlight was, of course, the penalty shootout between Weeping Willow and Wild Service Tree, available to enjoy online now. Uh, we've seen some favourites go through to the next round. Uh, Peduncular Oak, Hawthorn, Yew, Tulip Tree. And of course, the 2020 Urban Tree World Cup winners, London Plain, have all performed strongly. We've lost a few good sides as well. Cedar of Lebanon, Sweet Gum have gone crashing out. Today, it's Hornbeam against Strawberry Tree. So head over to the website or Twitter to cast your vote now. On the subject of Hornbeam, this is a seamless link. This is what us professionals can manage. Seamless. On the subject of Hornbeam, there's another great Urban Tree Festival event coming up on Friday at 6 p.m., which is going to answer the question, which is the true tree of London, plain or Hornbeam? So you can register for that via the link in the chat. It's obviously plain. And finally, I'd just like to preempt a couple of the questions, which will undoubtedly be asked in the next hour or so. Yes, the webinar will be recorded. Yes, you can get a certificate of attendance. If you tick the box saying you wanted one when you registered, then it will be sent to you over the next few weeks. Please don't hassle Sophie. She's very busy. Uh, and if you didn't tick that box, then please email certificates at trees.org.uk. If anyone has any questions, comments, feedback about the webinars or anything else, or if you'd just like to say hi, then please feel free to email me at john at trees.org.uk. That's all the boring stuff out of the way. So I'm now very excited to introduce our guests to the virtual stage. Tracy and John, welcome and over to you. Thanks. Can you hear us? Can everyone hear us? <laughs> I'm Tracy. I'm Jonathan. Hi. And we are actually from um, dialing in from Dorset. I know everybody's saying where they're from, and we're we're in a little um, area of Dorset called the Piddle Valley. Don't laugh. Yes, that's, that's uh, what it really is. That's Dorset, southwest England, uh, yes. rather than Cape Dorset in Canada or anywhere else. Um, uh, now, look, this is going to be uh, a lot less painful for all of us <laughs> if you've got a glass in your hand or a mug. Uh, depending what time of day you are uh, in the UK time zone, um, it's definitely wine time. Um, it's just going to be us talking uh, and reading. Uh, we might hold things up to the camera occasionally for you to look at. And the great thing is because we're in the same room together rather than on different screens, we can interrupt each other. And also we're husband and wife, um, so we tend to interrupt each other anyway. Don't we, dear? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we should start talking about our childhood trees, don't you? Yes. And yes. maybe I'll go first. Okay. Like in our script. <laughs> what is your childhood memory of trees because I think we talk about childhood so much with trees that's where a lot of people were introduced to trees and how they grew their love of trees. Yeah so uh, if we're thinking of heart and soul uh, it's a good place to start. So I remember um, you, you, you mentioned John uh, about the cedar of Lebanon, Cedrus Libani, Cedrus Libani um, crashing out of your, um, uh, your, your uh, uh, little game. <laughs> um, and it, 
had sort of crashed out of my life when I was about uh, five or six. And I remember uh, walking in Richmond Park with my parents um, to see a tree that we used to see uh, sort of every week, really, when we walked there, which is a fantastic cedar of Lebanon. And uh, one time we came across it and uh, it was it, it had been struck by lightning and died and it was being sawn up. And I remember um, up until that point, I think that I had just thought that my parents were in benign control of, of everything, really. And um, and I, I kind of realised at that point that they weren't. And uh, it was the first time that I saw my father cry. And, you know, that for a, uh, a small child was quite a sort of moving moment. And I remember my mother at the time looking at the tree and saying, do you know, there was a whole world in that tree. And, uh, you know, at the time I just took her literally uh, and I thought, you know, she means all the insects and birds and things or, you know, they explained that to me. Um, but over the years, I've realized that uh, it was a metaphor really for um, my father's, uh, you know, had come to Britain as a, as a refugee and had lost his family. And, uh, you know, for, for her, it was a, a metaphor for what had happened to, to them. Um, so, so my early memory was of this sort of, um, uh, you know, a, a complete shift in my world view uh, and the idea that there was a whole world, for me at the time, literally, a whole world in that tree. Um, and that's, I suppose, what we're going to talk about. What was your first? Well, it's interesting because when you were, while you're talking, I just glanced down at the chat and I saw somebody, I'm sorry, I, I missed your name, but um, saying that your favorite tree was your, the tree, an apple tree in your garden when you were growing up and you learned to climb in that tree. Uh, and that was how you learned to climb trees. And, and that's exactly me, except it wasn't an apple tree. I grew up in Washington, DC, and in our backyard, we had a beech tree. Um, beech trees are really great for uh, for climbing because their bark is so smooth. So it's not it doesn't hurt you. It's not rough. And when I was about five, I had an older brother and sister, and they um, there was a branch that I couldn't quite reach, and they could. And if you could reach that branch and a little one above it, you kind of swing your legs up and over this other branch. These two branches, you pull yourself up and you get up into the tree. So I was always watching them, um, and. Uh, get up into this tree and I couldn't because I couldn't quite reach it. And um, my dad was a photographer for the Washington Post and he went on a canoe trip down the Potomac River with a journalist and he took photos and the journalist wrote and they did this for the, the Potomac Magazine, which is the magazine for the, the Washington Post. He was away for three weeks. And while he was away, I learned to climb the tree. I guess I was just, just strong enough and just tall enough and I managed to get up into the tree. I was so proud of myself. I was up there, the first time I'd gotten up, dad arrived home <laughs> and the, he parked the car at the end of the yard um, in the alley and my brother and sister scrambled down, dad, and they went running to see him and I was stuck up in the tree because I could get up, I didn't know how to get down. So it's like, ah, hello. Um, so that tree, I remember really well and for climbing it. And when you climb a tree, you literally get close to it. You know, you're hugging it, you're holding on to it. You use it as a seat or as a sofa. I read books up there. I cried up there if I was upset. And it was, um, it was a real structure in my life. So that's my first memory of trees. So, so this audience uh, that we have tonight, there are a lot of um, professional arboriculturalists in the audience as well as lay members of the public. And if you're a professional, you'll be asked quite often, um, you know, uh, by, by the public um, about trees. And one of the things that I think both of us have found is that if you give something of yourself in the way that we've just tried to do, um, that makes the communication much easier. And, uh, and, it, and it sort of draws them out into, into things that they can talk about. Now, beech, I think, is uh, particularly appropriate. Um, uh, this is Fagus sylvatica, uh, a, a, a particularly appropriate uh, for a for a writer. Um, yes, it's got smooth. So I chose well. Didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> it's got smooth complexion, of course. Uh, when oaks and other uh, similar trees grow, new bark forms underneath uh, the the bark on the outside. Um, but the outer surface can't expand, so it cracks and forms ridges. And uh, with the beech, 
it sloughs off or sloughs off, sloughs off, sloughs off little little sort of particles all the time. So it stays smooth. And that smoothness has meant that, of course, people use it. Man's desire to fill the blank page, women's desire to fill the blank page. It makes it perfect for beech bark graffiti. And uh, the, Roman, the Roman poet Virgil, um, he complained, uh, actually completely hypocritically, because he did it himself. He complained about people carving their names and whatnot and love letters into, into trees. Um, beach boards were used to frame vellum manuscript pages. And in most European languages, the word for book and the word for beach are very similar, very closely related. So in German, uh, you have Bruch and Bücher. Um, and the words of, an, of the alphabet in German are Buchstaben, literally the, the stab marks, the cutting marks um, cut into beach boards. Medieval writing desks were, were made from beach. And early experiments in printing used letters that were carved from beach. So beach really is the sort of, the, I think, the, the, writer's, um, uh, the writer's tree. But it has a very particular feel, doesn't it? Yeah, very wood. smooth. Um, and uh, as I said, it's a great tree. To yeah, the, the, uh, but, uh, but actually the, a beach forest, a yeah. beach wood has really, a particular sort of... Very different because nothing grows under it for some reason. You probably know why. I don't. Do you know why nothing grows under a beach tree? I'm sure all you are... Ever arboreals out there no but um, well, some things grow but it, but it, the beach, beaches are particularly good at filtering out a lot of the light that's coming in so the beach yeah. beach woods tend to be quite quite dark and um but what you've um uh, what we're going to do now is have two short readings um and where both of us have tried to uh, come at a particular tree this time the birch um uh, betula and uh, we'll, you know, um, my, my bit that I'll read now is, is non-fiction, and then Tracy will read a, a, a story about Birch, and uh, you can see how um, both of us with our different lenses have come at a, a tree with some, some differences, but also some similarities in our approach. So I'll, I'll begin. And I'm going to depart. Don't worry, it's not going to be ours. <laughs> um, with cascades of delicate pendulous branches that sway in any breeze, the silver birch is as graceful as a ballet dancer. Its fluttering leaves are pale green diamonds, serrated and borne on slender twigs, warty from their resin glands. Its implausible paleness is an adaptation, helping trees that lack the shade of dense foliage to keep cool trunks in the day and night sunshine of a northern summer. Sorry. Uh, in the, of a northern summer or in the glare of snow. The bark of young birches is invitingly smooth. In 1988, the Finnish people, ever enthusiasts for democracy, voted the silver birch their national tree. Their choice had little to do with its commercial use for pulp and ply, nor its excellence as firewood, but was an expression of emotion. By day, the distinctive monochrome pattern of snow-clad birch forests is dazzling and disorientating, but during long boreal nights, their moonlit, ghostly forms take on an eerie power. Birches abound in the folk tales of northern peoples, and many superstitions and rituals surround the tree. Trees often develop symbiotic relationships with mycorrhizal fungi, which intermingle with their roots and extend beyond them in a huge web of minutely thin filaments. These networks are especially good at extracting nutrients from the soil, which they pass on in an easily digestible form. In return, the fungus receives sugars from the tree. Individual tree species cooperate with particular fungi. The birch's life partner is Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric, whose fruiting bodies, the parts we see above ground, are scarlet with white sprinkles, the archetypal toadstools of every fairy tale. Fly agarics contain a cocktail of mind-bending hallucinogens around which all manner of shamanistic rituals have evolved, particularly among Siberian tribes and the Sami people of Northern Finland and Sweden. So far, so human, many cultures have psychedelic traditions. However, the fly agaric's psychoactive ingredients are not completely broken down in the body, but excreted. This offers the enticing possibility of intoxication and a spot of social bonding by drinking the pre-drugged urine of others. Now it's true that northern nights are especially, especially long and the forests might have been lacking in other excitement. 
However, one can't help wondering whether this practice was really as widespread as the few historic travelers who seem to be the common source of all the shamanistic pea drinking stories were told and so eagerly reported. That's from around the world in 83. I'll now hand over to Tracy for another view of the perch. I'm not sure I could talk that. Everybody rush out and have a little drink. Yes, that'll be interesting. Okay. Um, years ago, John was on the board of the Woodland Trust, which is a UK charity um, which supports uh, replanting and protecting UK natives. Uh, uh, woods and trees and planting, etc. And I got in, dragged in, and then very willingly dragged in to um, to help create a book about trees. And what I came up with was um, Why Willows Weep: Contemporary Tales from the Woods. So I asked um, a whole bunch of different UK writers to choose a UK native and write a short fable, just a couple of pages, about a particular tree. So what I'm going to do is read Why Birches Have Silver Bark, which is the one I wrote. Birch trees did not always have silver bark. There was a time when their trunks were the gray-brown of most other trees. It was sex that changed things. It always does. Long ago, a girl grew up in a village surrounded by thick forests full of all sorts of trees. Elm, ash, beech, birch, oak, rowan, hawthorn, hornbeam. She loved trees and knew the forest well. Unfortunately, the girls were very strict and would not allow her to have a boyfriend. The men in the village were not good enough for her, they felt. The girl was less picky and more hormonal. One day she arranged to meet a man. Come to the ash grove north of the village at midnight, she whispered to him as they drew water from the village well. He nodded, too ashamed to admit he had no idea what an ash tree looked like. Instead, he crashed about in the woods for an hour before giving up and going home. He's too interested in football to care about me, the girl thought, and set her sights on another. Meet me at the stand of beech trees east of the village, she instructed as they were buying bread at the baker's. This man also knew more about sports than trees and didn't even get beyond the willows at the edge of the village before he turned back. The girl decided to make it as easy as possible for her next potential lover. Do you know the old oak that stands on its own in the middle of the woods to the south of the village, she said, as they waited for their flower to be ground at the village mill. Meet me there. Surely everyone knows what an oak looks like, but no. The man stood under a lone elm, wondering if its wood would make a good cricket bat. The girl waited under the oak tree and wept at the thought of dying a virgin. My parents are right, she sobbed. The village men are too stupid for me. She gave up on men then, until one day, a stranger arrived. Not only was he handsome, but he also didn't care much about sports. Turning down the chance to play five-a-side football or cricket on the village green, instead. He wove the girl a daisy chain. She took this as a good sign and invited him to meet her, though she decided to test him on his tree knowledge. Only a tree loving man would do. Meet me in the birch wood to the west of the village, she commanded. The man agreed. Unfortunately, however, he was from the city where even fewer people know about trees. And being a man, he wouldn't admit he couldn't tell a birch from a beech. He simply trusted fate. If they were meant to be together, he would find her. Now, the birch trees had already had some of the other suitors stumble through them on their abortive rendezvous. So when the girl came to wait among them, they knew what might happen. Indeed, as it grew late and the man did not arrive, the girl began to weep. Then the moon appeared from behind a cloud, lighting up the forest. Among the birches, there was one tree with mutant genes that had made its bark silvery white. The other birches had often teased it for being different, but on this night, its difference became its strength. For when the moonlight struck it, it lit up like a beacon in the dark forest. Seeing its glow, the man made straight for it and there found the girl. She was so relieved to have a lover at last 
that in her post-coital bliss, she vowed to protect the silver birch from ever being chopped down. This protected status ensured not only its long life, but its propagation as well. After a time, silver birches became the norm. They are still the best trees for a tryst. Oh, bravo, isn't that great? Um, the thing that gets me about that story every time is that in my mind, every fable is set in Eastern Europe. Uh, it's um, got and, a certain Eastern Europe look about it, like Scepter of the Village Green Cricket. Yeah, and the five-a-side <laughs> football. Where did that come from? I've been living in England for a long time. <laughs> but there is a very important word in that book, that fable, propagation. 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 Absolutely. We're going to talk about propagation. It's, it's almost as if that's a segue into something, isn't it? <laughs> almost. Um, it, it, so look, both, both approaches that we've used there, we've tried to say something about our kind of human reactions to the tree, um, as, as well as everything else. So, you know, one is clearly a story and the other one, I hope, uh, kind of works as a story, albeit a non-fiction story. And it's the human aspects and uh, the, the sort of emotional side that captures most audiences. Um, now, consider all of this from a tree's point of view. They're rooted to the spot. Um, they have to find uh, food and water, food being carbon dioxide from the air and water from, uh, from through the roots. They have to defend themselves against all those things that would come along and think that they are lunch. Um, and somehow they need to continue the line. They need to have babies. Um, and uh, they need to have those babies in such a way that they're not going to compete with the parent tree. So rooted to the spot, trees have lots of ways of kind of coping with this. Um, one, one way would be um, asexually, so that they can have suckers. Um, you know, so plants like um, uh, ground elder, uh, don't we just love that? Um, or uh, aspens, or, or, um, or the, the elms are, are perfectly capable of, of you know, distributing themselves uh, with seeds, but actually they, they go even better with suckers. And they, the Romans planted um, uh, elms all over the country to grow their, wine, their vines up because they were partial to wine too. And uh, of course, things that, that, um, that, that propagate vegetatively, that is with, with suckers or with parts of themselves, they're all clones of each other or very, very genetically similar. And that means that like the elms, um, they, they can be vulnerable to disease. So, uh, you know, because if, if something affects one of them, it'll affect all of them. So the, the other kind of um, way that trees propagate is sexually, either with cones or the, the kind of most common thing that we see is flowers, pollen, fruit and seeds. Mm. And, um, you know, it's, it's rather kind of wonderful to me that uh, flowers, which are evolved essentially to be attractive, uh, you know, they need to find uh, an insect or a, a, some other organism. Attractive to insects. Yeah, yeah. A, a creature that yeah. will come along um, and uh, will, will, in exchange sometimes for nectar or, or something, will, will um, douse themselves in pollen and take those sex cells which are in the pollen, the male sex cells, straight to the female parts of another flower. That, that's what it's all about, birds and bees. Yeah, but can I just ask you why um, we're attracted flowers too? Uh, that's true. So, and what's the point of that? I mean, what's the, what's the point? What's the point? What's the um, point? But we're attracted by the color. We're attracted by the scent. Yeah. So, so I, I think it's rather sort of wonderful that that flowers, which have evolved to be attractive to other organisms, are attractive to us. And um, but we don't pollinate them. Yeah. Uh, well, sometimes we do, but the ones that but we we find um, flowers attractive, and I think that's because um, we associate flowers with fertility and food because after the flower comes the seeds uh com comes the fruit and then comes the seeds mm -hmm. and uh those are both things that we tend to eat because the 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 plants put an awful lot of effort um and resources and nutrients therefore into the, the these th you know the, into the seeds and the um into their future generation so essentially you know, you, you know, there are some seeds that float on air, like birch uh, that we've been mm. talking about, or kapok. Um, but there are other seeds that are embedded in sweet, tasty fruit, and they they've evolved to be swallowed, right? And the thing is that, that if you're a seed, you really don't want to be inside the digestive tract of a tract of a of an animal for too long, no, because uh, and you certainly don't want to be ground up by their teeth. So 
uh, very often what you find is that the seed, uh, the actual sort of business bit of the seed, uh, contains either things that are poisonous or very nasty to taste. And uh, so in coffee and chocolate, for example, the actual fruit bit outside the coffee seeds are quite nice, sort of cross between apricot and watermelon, really. Um, and chocolate um, has this sort of fantastic kind of uh, nutritious outer coating. But inside you have these chemicals like caffeine and theobromine in chocolate, which are actually very bitter. And they put off animals from uh, grinding those teeth, uh, gr grinding those seeds with their teeth, and instead they swallow them. And then, of course, um, what, what do fruits have in them? Laxatives. So that uh, you, you know, you or the, the animal poo out, out yeah. uh, poo out, not just poo them out, you know, uh, so it's not too long in your gut getting attacked by all the acids and things, but actually uh, pooed out with a little pile of fertilizer, which is even better. Very clever. So. Um, I'm going to uh, do a, a, a short reading now about the nutmeg. Uh, this is from the, um, uh, it's a tree, but it's in Around the World in 80 Plants, which has just come out. And uh, this is a, uh, a, a tree that um, I, th I think, you know, just has uh, quite, a, quite a lot of interesting aspects to it uh, in terms of both the way it looks and also, you know, how the seed um, uh, contains uh, chemicals that can affect mammals. Nutmeg flowers, although pale and inconspicuous, are fragrant and shaped like dainty urns, while the fruit are yellowish, speckled and about the size of a tennis ball. A single tree can yield thousands in a season. At the centre, in a glossy shell, sits the rough nutmeg kernel, or nut, that is well known as a spice. Its flavour is special, warm, woody and thrillingly unique. The pleasure of its scent is enhanced by the intricate patterns of vessels containing the essential oils gradually revealed by grating. Girdling the shiny nut is a succulent lacy layer, an utterly sensual blood red aril or seed covering, which is itself surrounded by a fleshy husk. When the fruit is ripe, the husk splits, revealing the garish aril, an alluring snack for nutmeg pigeons and their reward for dispersing the seed. The aril, which is the spice known as mace, dries to a warm beige and has a softer and more complex flavour than nutmeg. A little nutmeg is a warming delight, but a whole seed or two in one go is dangerously narcotic and widely reported to be hallucinogenic. One would need to be desperate for a high though, since the side effects, vomiting, confusion, dizziness and heart arrhythmia, are discouraging. It has only ever been a psychoactive drug of last resort. The African-American activist Malcolm X wrote in his autobiography about using nutmeg in jail in the 1940s. It was later banned from prison kitchens in the United States to avoid misuse. And generations of students have tried and generally failed to achieve a cheap and rewarding nutmeg high. The most common misuses of nutmeg these days are to powder it too far in advance of use or to heat it for too long. Both culinary crimes destroy its precious but fugitive flavor. Nutmeg should be grated respectfully at the end of cooking. That way, even boiled rice pudding can be a pleasure. So interestingly, um, uh, nutmeg, uh, you, you know, which wars were fought between the French, the Dutch, the British um, over, over nutmeg, and that, that's quite well known. Um, but perhaps less well known is that in 1667, the, uh, the British gave up their right to um, the, the island of Run, which is now in Indonesia. Um, the, uh, they gave up their, their claim on it to the, uh, to the Dutch. Um, and in return for monopoly nutmeg rights, they, they swapped it for a little Dutch outpost in North America called Manhattan. So Manhattan was traded for monopoly nutmeg rights. Right, but what you're trying to say is don't try this at home, kids, <laughs> with the old nutmeg, because it has pretty bad effects, but yes. Um, and it, so um, a lot of fruits, as I mentioned, have these sort of things that discourage um, animals from eating, eating the seeds. And apples are a really good example of that. They, uh, apple seeds, can t you know, they're bitter, they're unpleasant, and they're actually quite poisonous. If you, you know, there are people who've sort of, chewed them as snacks and, and had pretty bad effects. There are cyanide type compounds in there um, to discourage things from eating them. And, uh, uh, you know, that leads us neatly on, doesn't it? Well, um, 
apples were of uh, apple trees were a big part of a, a novel I wrote called at the, at the Edge of the Orchard several years ago, and um, I got interested in it because of a uh, a legendary man called Johnny Appleseed. Any Americans in the audience will know it, um, know him immediately, you learned about him at school. And he basically went through, his name, his real name was John Chapman, and he went through um, Ohio and Indiana in the early part of the 19th century, um, selling and planting apple trees, uh, selling uh, both saplings and also bags, handing out bags of seeds to settlers. Now, when people were uh, settling or moving west in the States, pioneers, um, when they moved to Ohio, if they wanted to claim land, uh, there was a requirement that they planted an orchard and um, they had to plant 50 trees, 50 fruit bearing trees within three years of settling. And this was uh, like putting your marker down saying, I'm staying. Um, and Johnny Appleseed was there as in a way as a businessman who brought uh, uh, trees west from, uh, he used to pick up all these seeds from um, a cider mill in Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania and then take them west. And he'd go around in his canoe on all these rivers and hand out saplings. And it was a way, it was, it was like a, he was a human dispersal agent, you know, he was, he was moving the, literally moving the seeds around in a way that, um, you know, you wouldn't have actually thought that's not what a tree normally does. It, uh, it grows the apple, the bird eats it, the bird poos it out away from the parent tree. And that's, that's how it propagates. But this was an actual person doing this with thousands, millions of trees. And um, so he was, he became very well known, but he was, um, he became well known after his death. Uh, he was kind of resurrected as a, as a folk hero who, who um, spread apples, which are meant to be good for you. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. This was actually during prohibition when um, uh, all the, the society ladies really didn't like the idea of what Johnny Appleseed was really doing, which in the 19th century, what he was planting seeds from apple trees. Now, if you plant a seed from an apple tree, only one in 10 chance of that tree becoming, uh, producing sweet apples. Most of the time it's gonna be sour apples and you can't eat sour apples. I mean, you could kind of cook them, but not that well. And um, what they were actually grown for in Ohio and Indiana and elsewhere was to make cider. Um, the water supply was terrible. And so people tended to drink, and life was hard. So they made, um, they made apple cider that was alcoholic, became alcoholic and they drank cider and they drank Applejack, which was a kind of brandy. Um, and uh, that was what John Chapman, Johnny Appleseed was doing. He was spreading the alcohol far and wide and his reputation got kind of renovated and changed. Yes, cheers everybody. It got kind of changed by these women who wanted to promote him as, um, as it being something healthy. And I found this fascinating. And I thought, I don't want John Chapman or Johnny Appleseed to be the main character in the story, but I want him to be part of it and an important small part of it. Now, what he did was he planted seeds straight into the ground and he didn't, um, most of the time it pr produced uh, what were they called spitters. So um, tree uh, apples you couldn't eat, you had to use to make cider. Um, if you wanted a sweet tree, you had to graft. So that's another way of uh, human propagation of apple trees. And grafting is when you take, um, uh, an apple tree produces really nice, sweet tasting apples. You love it. You cut a branch from it and you take the branch and you cut a, you take the rootstock from another tree and you stick it in there and you wind it all around. They used to put all this kind of mud and linen all around it. And if it took, after a few weeks, the sap rises up through the rootstock and goes into the tree. If it works, then you get an apple tree. And actually every um, uh, sweet producing apple tree or whatever you want. So every uh, golden delicious apple that you had have came from one tree. It's basically cloning. Um, and uh, every Bramley apple you've cooked with comes from a tree in Nottinghamshire. If there's anybody here from Nottinghamshire, I salute you because you have got an amazing tree and a, and a cottage that's still there um, being looked after uh, in a cottage garden. So there are particular trees, specific trees that all the other trees have come from. And I found this really fascinating. And I just thought I would read a short section 
um, about grafting. So uh, at the edge of the orchard is, uh, this is the American cover, there's lots of different covers, but um, at, the, uh, at the edge of the orchard is about a pioneer family who move west from Connecticut, from the coast um, into Ohio. They want more land, they wanna see if they can make a living and they end up in this place called the Black Swamp, which is really horrible. And um, it's the last part of Ohio to be, um, to be settled. Uh, and James, Good, the, the family's called the Goodenoughs and James Goodenough is really obsessed with trees and he's brought apple trees from Connecticut and he's grafting them um, to make an orchard. And I'm just gonna read to you a very short section between him and his son, Robert, who's about nine, I think. Where do those golden pippins come from? James quizzed his son, Robert. Connecticut. And before that, England. Your grandparents brought over branches of their favorite apple tree. Where in England? Robert stared at his father with his unsettling eyes and shook his head. He was not the kind of boy to bluff if he didn't know. James was glad of his honesty. Herefordshire, now, tomorrow we'll graft. Go and check the grafting clay, make sure it hasn't dried out. If it needs a little, add a, add a little water and stir it in. Robert nodded. You know what you're looking for? You don't mean, need me to check it with you? I'm all right, Pa. Robert trudged off towards the river, picking up a wooden bucket as he went. Most springs, James Goodenough grafted a few apple trees, turning spitters into eaters or poor spitters into better spitters. In Connecticut, he had learned from his father how to make a productive tree from an indifferent one. And though he now had performed successful grafts dozens of times, he still appreciated the surprise of this recreation. Grafting had always seemed a miracle to James, that you could take the best part of one tree, its roots, say, bind it to the best part of another tree, one producing sweet apples, and create a third tree, strong and productive. It was a little like making a baby, he supposed, except that you had control over what characteristics you chose. His wife, Sadie, viewed grafting with suspicion, an attitude she had picked up from John Chapman. You ain't God she liked to say, chopping and changing, making monsters. It ain't right. James noticed, though, that she still ate the apples from the grafted trees. So that's one, two ways of uh, human propagation is, is through, you know, planting seeds and grafting. And I, I spent, um, I was really interested in how trees, although we think of individual trees as not moving, you know, they're planted, they're in one place. Trees themselves as, as in general do move around. For one thing, they, they seed dispersal, they, they move from the parent tree, but also humans have brought trees with them everywhere they go. So apple trees, it always amuses me when people say as American as apple pie, because actually apples are not American. They originally come from Kazakhstan and they were brought along the, um, the Silk Road, along the trade route by, uh, and the Romans ended up bringing them to the UK. And then British settlers brought them to America. So that's, that was their, so they're, they're immigrants just the way we are, just the way you and I are and, uh, and everybody, we all move around and so do trees and actually so do plants as well. I really like the idea of um, there having been this rule that, uh, you know, in order to claim a bit of land, you've got to plant some trees on it. And I, I kind of wish that, um, you know, any sort of developers who, who buy land, um, you know, as part of the deal uh, in owning land, you had to uh, um, plant things on it, um, uh, you know, the right kind of things, obviously. Um, well, there's something about that that is, is really about looking to the future, and it's not necessarily for yourself, but for, your, for, your, uh, for the future generations. Yeah, I mean, the danger is that people who sort of put up buildings will be saying they're thinking of the future, but I want them to think about the future in the way that I think about the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, many trees have been moved by uh, humans an awful long way from their native, native range, so uh, apples, as we've heard from, uh, from Kazakhstan. Um, you know, one of the earliest stories of biopiracy was, uh, you know, the Royal Botanic Gardens queue, with which I was very happy to have a long connection, um, uh, taking uh, rubber 
from South America and, and working out how to propagate it and germinate it and so on, and then uh, uh, you know having it planted elsewhere in the British colonial system in Malaysia. Um, the uh, uh, of course, from the rubber trees point of view, the uh, the latex uh, has a purpose, which is to seal wounds, um, to sort of gum up the mouth parts of, of insects and things when they uh, when they attack. Um, but some of these latexes uh, have been very very important for us and have um, uh, therefore meant that we've we've taken them from one part of the world to another. Um, another one is uh, gutta percha, pal palaquium gutta percha, um, which is uh, uh, cha which changed the world completely in the in the 19th century, and uh, it didn't change the world because um, its latex can be used to make golf balls. Though I suspect for some people that probably did change their world, um, but it uh, turned out to be the thing that could be used for insulating submarine cables. And why I hear you ask, as one, um, uh, you know, is that so important? Well, it's so that nation can talk to nation because uh, that's how telephone calls were transmitted through submarine cables. And uh, after a few decades, there were 250,000 miles of cables that were all insulated with uh, the um, uh, product of the latex uh, of these, uh, these trees. Um, other trees that have been taken around the world is the familiar monkey puzzle, Ar Araucaria. Um, which we both hate. Um, from, Just saying. From, from, from Chile, um, which, it, you know, it, it, uh, it graces in, in Britain, it graces suburban gardens. And um, yeah, frankly, we find it rather vulgar, don't we? <laughs> um, but, um, uh, you know, it has armour uh, that is, you know, why did that evolve? Uh, when you look at it and you look at um, Chile today and you think, well, why does it need such armor? Well, it, it evolved at the time when there were sort of very large and very alarming beasts around that would otherwise eat it and that are now extinct. But human intervention can go very, very badly wrong. And the world is littered with examples of plants that growing in the absence of the things that would normally eat them back home uh, and keep them under control become invasive. So I mentioned ground elder, which is the sort of bete noir of every gardener in this country, uh, in England. Um, but there's the prickly pear cactus. Wherever you go in the world, people think that the prickly pear is a sort of local thing in any arid region, but actually it comes from Mexico and it was, it was carted off around the world um, by people who wanted to grow cochineal beetles on it um, to uh, sort of uh, to dye that sort of lovely scarlet, scarlet color for military uniforms and flags and things. In fact, the Star Spangled Banner, um, was was um, dyed with cochineal. Um, but away from home and away from all those finicky little insects that have been bred for centuries by the Aztecs, um, it, this, this plant uh, just didn't have anything that would eat it. Um, and, uh, you know, by 1925, um, 100,000 square miles of Australian grazing land was taken over by prickly pear cactus. And they dumped all sorts of chemicals, arsenic and everything else, which still has a, a horrible effect today. Uh, all over it um, and tried to kill it. And eventually they found another moth from Mexico that would, uh, whose larva, larvae would, would eat this cactus. And of course that's now attacking cacti elsewhere. Um, the back to trees. Yeah, yeah, back to trees. Um, the, um, you know, the, there are two urban trees I'd like to mention that are, um, you know, absolutely hellish, um, that, that human intervention has sort of caused a bit of a disaster. One of them is the, the um, well, you know, back in the 1850s, someone had the bright idea of taking a hardy yellow cedar from Oregon um, and a super fast growing but rather weedy uh, kind of Monterey cypress from California and planting them next to each other in a garden in Wales. Um, what could possibly go wrong? Well, the, the, the thing that went wrong uh, was that it turned into this monster uh, called Leylandii which is the, um, you know, the, the tree that British people love to hate. It's the thing that they plant as, as, as sort of like a living hedge. Um, at the end of the, uh, it, was, it was named after uh, Christopher Leyland, who, who owned the estate that these two trees had sex in. And it's, um, you know, it's indestructible. It grows at a million miles an hour. And in a sort of peculiarly British way, they, uh, the British people have sort of used it to mark territory. And, and to sort of get privacy. And uh, at the end of the 1990s, there were 18,000 simultaneous court cases going on um, uh, of people who were sort of, and murders as well, that was terrible, you know. The, 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 and um, 
uh, you know, people sort of uh, complaining about the, the trees. And in the end, um, guided through the House of Lords by, the, you couldn't make this up, by the Lady Gardener of Parks, nice. is her name. Um, they, uh, it, you know, the, a law came in that, uh, you know, they could use antisocial behaviour orders to stop people growing these trees. And the, the thing that had been the main object of these antisocial behaviour orders up until that point had been um, either people playing hi-fis too loud and having loud parties or Staffordshire pit bull terriers and control of those. And now the thing is, Staffordshire pit bull terriers are another um, you know, very vigorous hybrid of two other things. And often when you get these two, two species that are sort of a bit weedy and then you hybridize them, you get something that is sort of super, super, super exuberant. Um, hybrid vigor, it, it's called. And, and this is what's happened in Staffordshire pit bull terriers and in Leylandii. And then the second um, one I just wanted to mention, I, I, I haven't got time to, to sort of do the reading about it, but is Elanthus. Elanthus is known uh, as the tree of heaven <laughs> or tree of hell uh, if you're in, in the United States. Uh, ironically, the uh, US Department of Agriculture kind of sent seeds all around the country. Um, uh, it, it was an import from China and they thought this would be a nice thing for people to grow. It grows very easily and it, you know, might get some interesting timber out of it. It's got quite a nice sort of oriental look, loads of seeds, 350,000 seeds for each one, uh, for each tree. And it is completely indestructible and it'll, it'll grow up through buildings and through concrete and it's, it's sort of resistant to just about everything. Um, and is a terrific example of you know, something that you really don't want to import. Um, uh, Elanthus a altissima grows incredibly high. And it, uh, there was a, a novel called a, 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 tree, a, tree, a tree Grows in Brooklyn. Betty Smith, yeah. Um, that uh, is very uh, sort of, it's, it's about the sort of tough life of an immigrant. And, you know, there are two sides to this, obviously, you know, that, that this tree is a sort of beautiful thing, but it's also, uh, as, as, as she wrote, um, you know, it's beautiful, but you can have too much of it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, she, um, uh, you know, th th this is one of the things you need to sort of think about when you bring in, um, you know, species, plant species from, from other places. Mm. Um, there's uh, uh, one of the more delightful introductions in, into the UK is, is the redwood, though, yeah. uh, which has not been a, um, something that's sort of uh, got out of control. And uh, you know, there's a there was a bit of a, pl uh, a planting craze for it in the 19th century, and we we visited a lovely grove in Wales 30, thirty something years ago. Yeah, yeah, and it, there are 33 uh, redwoods and um, about 150 years old, which actually is quite young for redwoods. So they're not as as huge and amazing looking as they are in say California and the Pacific Upper Northwest. But um, they stuck in my mind, and when I was uh, writing at the edge of the orchard, I I decided um, I, I the the book takes place in two places on the in, in Ohio um, with and the apple tree is the anchor there, and I wanted it to be about the movement west and so that young boy Robert who I read about before, he grows up and he ends up going west and he goes to California, um, and he discovers uh, redwoods he becomes introduced to redwoods and sequoias and um, they are the other anchor of the book. And it's, a, it's the idea of this kind of motion of trees moving from uh, apples coming from Kazakhstan, making it all the way to America. And um, strangely enough, the Victorian craze for taking uh, trees like monkey puzzles, which I see in the chat, we have offended some people by saying we didn't like it. Okay, we all have our own tastes. Um, just wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, redwoods and sequoias and other trees from California and the Pacific Upper Northwest became very popular in Victorian pinetums, as they're called, where they, you'd have collectors who collect trees from all over the world and um, they planted redwoods and sequoias. And that's the, the redwood grove we saw was part of that. And actually the Lalanda is not far from there, um, Kim, in, in Wales. So I'm gonna read a, just a really short section where Robert is, um, comes upon these sequoias for the very first time. Oops. Okay. When Robert arrived at the edge of Calaveras Grove, he dismounted and stood 
hand on his horse's neck anchoring him. In his travels, he had seen many things that had given him an ache deep in his chest, like a splinter of sad sadness needling into his heart. Prairie that swept far out of sight, a tornado cycling across the gray green horizon, snow covered mountain tops that hung overhead like white triangles. Now he was seeing another. Two enormous trees stood on either side of the track, a natural entrance to the wood beyond. They were not as tall as Redwoods Robert had seen on the coast, but they were much wider, as wide at their bases as a cabin. They dwarfed a person with their girth and the volume of wood they thrust towards the sky. If you stood far enough back to take in the whole of the trees, you didn't feel how enormous they were. If you came up close though, you couldn't see their lowest branches. Robert left the horse and walked up the path, feeling as he did that he was shrinking into a speck beside the two trees. He put a hand on one to steady himself. The tawny red surface was spongy and thickly fissured, a fibrous bark that shed easily and turned into red dust Robert later found in his clothes and his hair, under his fingernails, in his saddlebags. The forest floor around the trees was thick and springy with thousands of years of rotting needles, muffling his steps. And it was quiet, for there were no branches anywhere near him to rustle in the wind. Branches only started to grow from about 100 feet up, and the bulk of them were so high over his head that it strained his neck to look at them for long. Robert had no words for the odd, hollowed out feeling that swelled inside him. Hello. One of the things that um, I, in your writing you tend not to do, uh, though you did in the Birch, is to sort of anthropomorphize. Yeah. So, you know, some, some people in their s stories, they, they create characters for the trees, don't they? Mm. Well, I, you know, I, I did think I make, how do I make trees into characters in, in the novel without making them seem like humans? And the way I did it, like specifically in that scene was to, to, describe them as carefully and, and physically as I could. So um, I went to Calaveras Grove myself, which is this massive grove of, of uh, sequoias. And one of the things I noticed right away was when people would go up to them, they would put their hand, they'd look up to see how high up they went and they'd put their hand to steady themselves. So I had Robert do that and then he touches it. And when you touch it, it's very springy it's um, there's all this red dust that comes off, and and I found it hours later, just the way Robert does in my under my fingernails, my clothes, and I wouldn't have known that until I had uh, I had gone there and done the research. So you always got to do the research, and and the springiness of the ground around it, which is of these compacted needles from thousands of years, and all of those things I think are really important to build up a picture of the tree as a tree. I want to keep trees trees, not make them into people. Except in the birch story. Except in the birch story, where I did do, um, I did change it. I, I made it, but but fables and fairy tales um, often anthropomorphize either animals or plants, um, and it's it's a way in a in a way of drawing humans in, drawing us in. I think it's also a way to, um, you know, perhaps it used to be a way to kind of bring nature under control. I think um, uh, fairy tales often. It dealt with quite difficult themes and you know the deep dark forest which would have you know been a very different place in the time before yeah, electricity yeah. And, and and so on um you know i i think this was a way of sort of helping uh, children at first perhaps but you know everyone to kind of deal with with the the sort of control over over nature one of the um uh, plants that I absolutely love. I realise we're running a bit short of time. Yeah. So, um, is is this? Uh, it's all right. I'm not going to read. So you, you just stay where you are. Um, but the <laughs> darling. Uh, but the uh, this uh, you can see uh, another one of Lucille's fantastic illustrations. This is the Mujar, um, or uh, I mean, Nightsia floribunda for for botanists there. But with the Western Australian Christmas tree, and this has a very sort of intentional kind of uh, feel to it because this tree will seek out, um, uh, it, it's a hemiparasite, so it does photosynthesize, but it, it, it'll seek out uh, the roots of other trees. It's got hydraulic secateurs, it plugs itself into uh, other plants and draws off uh, water and nutrients. 
and uh, um, it, the way it, se uh, it seeks out those plants is because it, the roots can sense various plant hormones and things. Um, and uh, so it, here's, the, here's the crazy thing, that the, some of these plant hormones are also present in plastics. Um, so the, the plastic insulation of buried telephone wires in, Australia, in Western Australia is a prime target for, um, uh, for, the, for this Western Australian Christmas tree. And it comes along and it severs, <laughs> severs um, uh, these telephone wires, which I think is a lovely way of nature getting its own back. Um, uh, that sort of uh, pleases me. But it's only a, a, a hop and a skip, isn't it, from anthropomorphizing to superstition. And I can imagine that in this audience where there are a lot of scientists and arboriculturalists, that there's a sort of mixed feelings about superstition. Um, I certainly have mixed feelings because, you know, superstition can be incredibly valuable, uh, as in, say, uh, Madagascar, where the superstition that one's ancestors live, it, the soul of one's ancestors is present in the baobabs, means that the baobabs um, have survived. And so that's a kind of good superstition. But then, of course, you know, we've got all sorts of other kind of pseudoscience going on with climate change denial and all kinds of other things, which we're not so happy with. It's a very difficult balance. Mm, I think. Yes, it is. It is. You know, I think because we're running short on time, we should probably leave that, leave it. <laughs> except, <laughs> well, except I think that we, um, uh, since we're not going to anthropomorphize trees, but we, what if we treeify ourselves? So if you were going to be, what's your favorite tree? If you're going to be a tree, what tree would you be? Um, uh, I, I would be uh, the Allodendron dichotoma, um, which is uh, this sort of, here's this glorious um, picture. Uh, that, that's, that's the aloe, which you know, aloe vera. Um, on this side, but this this is the tree, the Allodendron dichotoma, which is the quiver tree. It's called that because the San people of Namibia um, have used the hollow branches for keeping arrows in. And the reason I love that tree, uh, and if I was a tree, that's the tree I would be, is, is not because it thrives in the middle of the desert um, and is fantastically resilient, um, you know, how clever, uh, which it is. Uh, but um, for two reasons. One, it's the national tree of Namibia, which means that everyone smiles at it when they see it. It's like driving on Morris Minor. Um, and the second reason is that it's got this kind of funny waxy coating that makes you want to touch it. The waxy coating is there to protect itself from ultraviolet light, probably. Um, but the idea of being a tree that people smile at and want to stroke, I think I'd like to be the quiver tree of Namibia. <laughs> what about you, dear? I would like to be a copper beech. Um, I because I grew up with a beach that I that I uh, climbed. I have a real fondness for beaches, but copper beech is. Um, I only really got to know them when I moved to England thirty something years ago. And although I'm sure they have them in the states, but I I associate them with the countryside here. And I tend to I like to think of uh, my 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 American life was a green beach, and my uh, my British life is copper beach. So that's why be. So I think at that on that note, shall we uh, open it up, throw it open to questions and I, comments from you? I think I think it's a good idea. Um, time flies, doesn't it? Sure it sure does. Thank you very much both. I was going to say you could keep going for as long as you like, by the way. There's absolutely no, uh, there's no uh, time limit for you to at all. It's great. Um, brilliant. Thank you. Well, we've had lots of really good discussion in the chat and a few questions in the chat. If you've got questions, please put them in the Q&A panel because I get a little bit confused. I'm simple enough as it is and I'm losing stuff on there. Before it disappears, I'll ask you one that is in the chat from Kerry, uh, who's asked uh, if you're aware of the work of Suzanne Simard and uh, what you think of, of that work, because there's some remarkable work been done. It looks like you're preparing something there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, yes, uh, uh, that's aware, and actually, actually I'm going to, it's supporting the computer, that's kind of funny, isn't it? Um, it's just the right size. Um, but the, uh, in, in fact, I'm uh, doing a, an, an interview uh, with her um, uh, for, uh, you know, shortly in June, uh, I think it's June the 23rd for 5 by 15, uh, if people are interested. And, and Suzanne's work is, is really interesting um, because she was one of the first scientists to show uh, that 
uh, those mycorrhizal networks that I mentioned um, uh, when I was talking about the birch, um, they uh, sort of carry information between trees. Uh, so uh, uh, as as well as um, uh, as as well as carbon compounds and so on, the products of photosynthesis. Uh, so these fungal networks plug themselves into the roots of different trees, and you know if a tree is under attack, then uh, it's been shown that you know through the network, um, you know other trees that are kind of part of that fungal network can uh, essentially be triggered to uh, make defense chemicals and to, uh, you know, to defend themselves. And that the, at the beginning of the um, season, uh, you know, when the deciduous trees aren't really photosynthesizing very well, um, conifers can, uh, you know, have the products of photosynthesis, the, the sort of these carbon compounds and sugars and so on, uh, effectively transmitted through these networks um, uh, to, to the deciduous trees. And at the other end of the summer, it works the other way. So it isn't quite all dog eat dog as, as people used to sort of think in, in, in forests. And um, one of the interesting things about her, her work is that one of the questions I'm asked most frequently actually after um, uh, any, any, any talk about trees, and I suspect that a lot of the audience here are the same, is people want to know about sentience. They want to know if trees are intelligent. And I think we have to be really careful um, about extrapolating this kind of information transfer into intelligence, because you know information is transmitted between computers, for example, that aren't necessarily intelligent. They've been sort of evolved or programmed to do that. And uh, in you know ascribing intentionality to trees, I think is quite a, a sort of a difficult thing to do. Now, Suzanne doesn't do that in in her book. But I think one of the things to be aware, aware of is that a lot of the audience really, really, really want to believe that trees are intelligent and, you know, define intelligence, right? But uh, if you know that people have a particular sort of um, misconception, perhaps, about science and about what, what we know and don't know about trees, then one has to be a bit careful about what misconceptions you inadvertently reinforce. So uh, fantastic work there. And it's the great book, Suzanne Simard's book, Finding the Mother Tree. And somebody in the chat said that they think it's being made into a film. And yes, yes it, it is. is. Yeah. Yeah. Which is great to have a, a, a book about, a, a film about trees. I well, think. It's, it, it, well uh, the film will really be about her life yeah. uh, because she, she grew up as a logger. Um, a, a logging family and, and sort of, um, you know, poacher turned, uh, game pe keeper turned poacher or the other way around, right. or whatever it is. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> to say it's interesting as well, I think huge respect to Suzanne because um, she sort of started saying a lot of these things when everyone was like, that's crazy talk, that can't be true. And then now it's kind of not quite mainstream, maybe, but it's certainly getting there. And uh, she was out there right in front. Yeah, and she used, you know, proper, you know, sort of scientific techniques, you know, sort of, uh, yeah. you know, uh, so uh, radioactive markers for molecules mm -hmm. to see what exactly what molecules had gone where in a forest. So you could see, you know, exactly the root of everything. You know, I mean, she, you know, she did prop, proper work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And somebody um, in the chat just said one of the um, characters in, in Richard Powers, The Overstory, is based on her life, which is, yes, great book. Yeah, very, very good book. Highly recommended. I suppose on that theme, uh, another question in from Catherine asking whether or not you could expand on the relationship of trees and fungus and the mycelium network that helps trees communicate with each other. I would say that there's whole webinars we've done about fungal networks and mycelium that you're more than welcome to watch. Drop us an email. But I don't know, uh, Tracy, Jonathan, if you've got any thoughts on uh, it's on the same themes we've just discussed, really, but the importance yeah. perhaps of mycelium. Um, I, I think it's the uh, it, it is the same theme, and uh, you know I would just point you at well the work of of the Arboricultural Association actually you know is is, is really good in this regard. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's I think one of the interesting ways of looking at this is um, you know at first we look at everything from our point of view, don't we? We look at it through a human lens, and we think that you know trees must be acting like us. Um, uh, we anthropomorphize. And then the next stage from that is to say, oh, no, 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 no. Um, the trees are, you know, helping it, it have evolved to, to, for the good of the community of trees or the forest as a whole. Um, they've evolved to, uh, you know, 
be able to transmit information effectively, not necessarily intentionally, but the information is transferred um, in a forest for the good of the forest as a whole. And that's the tree's eye view. But how about this? Think of it from the fungus eye view, right? So if you think of it from the fungus's point of view, the fungus uh, benefits from having a uh, forest that is photosynthesizing um, more rather than less. Um, it's, it's, it benefits from having healthy trees, um, uh, you know, that are uh, photosynthesizing at lots of different times of the year, so that the fungus itself can get the products of photosynthesis. And in return, there's a payment. It, it sort of um, takes uh, you know, phosphates and minerals and so on out of the soil in a way that the tree roots can't do. But it's quite interesting to start looking at it from the fungus's point of view. They've man managed to manipulate the trees. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of people who would say that the, the fungi are farming the trees, really, and it's all yeah. about the fungi and the, the trees are just incidental. Uh, if everybody wants a talk that will really blow their minds, then at some point later this year, uh, Professor Lynn Boddy will hopefully be doing a talk about fungal memory and looking at whether or not fungi have memory. So fantastic. Yeah. Watch that, everyone. That would be great. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Um, okay, I think maybe even continuing that theme a bit further in a way, because I think it's all related. A question from Alan. Um, in the current climate of depleting ecology, how would you both use and sell the idea of trees and their benefits to persuade people to want to reconnect with the natural world and so endeavour to want to do more to protect their local ecosystems? The reason I said it's connected is because I think when people start understanding the work of Suzanne Simard, for example, it gives them a different perspective. But what other ways can you see trees being used as a to sell the natural world and that reconnecting people to nature? It's um, I mean, I think what what we've been emphasizing tonight is is the is the tell, telling stories and and the stories that trees that we can tell about them. But I I think another way of um, of of going at it is in a way what we started this talk out is what are our favorite trees is from our childhood. It's, it, it often starts there. And I think, you know, it's, it's a, I suppose it's an obvious answer. I'm sorry, I'm not being more creative, but, but it starts with your kids and it starts in school. Um, if, if it's, if it's not starting with your family, then it's starting with, with tree planting and tree playing actually. We, I think we don't let our kids play enough. You know, you have to, when I was a kid, everybody climbed trees and now it's a sort of anomaly to, to climb trees. And I, I think that it's important to let kids loose and let them go up them. And if they fall and break an arm, they do, but you know, it doesn't happen very often. So mostly it should be, um, it should be real crucial interaction, I think. And I think actually a lot of that happened during the pandemic, we were, um, we were in London and uh, during the first lockdown um, and we lived near Hampstead Heath and we went for a walk every day as did everybody else. We we're all desperate to get out. And I just noticed so many more kids climbing trees and, and really being there. And I think that makes a huge difference to your life. I, I think the key is, um, uh, you know, the, the danger is that uh, professional arboriculturalists and scientists um, see the world through a, a scientific lens. And the way that we persuade each other of things is by, um, you know, in the way that you, you persuade people to have a vaccine, say, is, is by saying, look how effective it is, look how little risk there is. Uh, you know, these are very measurable things. Um, but a large part of the world doesn't operate that way. Um, they operate on a, um, a much more emotional level. And I think that if you look at advertising, really good advertising, even if it's for products that you hate, um, and look at the techniques they use. I think that the uh, the tree world and the nature the nature world could learn a lot from that. So one of the things that I, I kind of cons consistently sort of moan about is the fact that a lot of the um, the oil industry, the fossil fuel industry, um, they they speak with a very coherent voice. Um, I mean, it's not a voice that I particularly like to hear at the moment. Uh, the, the messages that they're putting out, which I feel are, are a lot of greenwash, but but they, they do speak with a very coherent, clear voice. Whereas the environmental movement is very split between different organizations that all have their own different sort of angles, which are all important, you know, but um, you know, one of the things that we know in communication is to just sort of keep, keep saying the same thing over and over again, very, very loud um, and, and simplify and simplify, which of course scientists 
um, find very difficult to do because you always want to make it accurate and have the caveats and so on. And the other bit is, is the emotional connection. So what we're both trying to do in our different ways is to uh, create an emotional connection between people and the environment, which will mean that people uh, want to then care. And if people care, then they, they will protect. Absolutely, good answers both, thank you. Um, Tracy, just picking up on your point perhaps, there's a, a question came in uh, from Andrew about what do you feel would be the most effective way to broaden the interest in trees amongst the younger generations? But well, you're completely right when you said it starts with childhood and children climbing trees, learning about trees and then carrying that love through their life. But how do we go about actually engaging the younger generation? Well, I think one way of doing it is getting a kid to plant a tree and plant it when they're relatively young so that they follow its progress um, as it grows and they grow. Uh, so they go back and visit it every year or, or, or they plant it in if they have a green space near them that they can plant it in, something that they can see every day. And that that feeling of um, lengthening, you know, kids have a tendency to be very in the moment and it's, it's hard for them to um, to understand that a tree that they plant now is going to be how big it's going to be in 50 years time, but they can see how, how much it grows in a year's time. And I think that that having um, looking after it and, and feeling responsible for it gives them uh, more of a connection. Yeah, and I think, you know, the Woodland Trust does a lot of that, a lot of tree planting with school children. And I think what's really important about that is not just the planting the tree, but going back with the same class two years later to see how they've done, you know, and maybe the kid remembers, they take a picture so they can remember which tree they planted and did it survive or not, because a lot of times they don't, but sometimes they do. And it's, you know, I think that that kind of um, nurturing makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very glad you said that, Tracy. We always, we always say a lot of this at the Arb Association, that all of these um, tree planting targets are wonderful. Of course, we all want trees to go in the ground, but there's no point planting trees if you're not going to maintain them, make sure they're established, look after them for the long term. And I think getting children not just to plant trees, but then to go back and check how they're doing uh, is, yeah. is a really important message. I mean, I, the, the government is, has talked about this new uh, tree planting scheme, the Queens for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, and that's, that's great, but I think it's also really important. It's actually quite hard to plant a tree. You know, we, we've been given trees before and we don't have that much space and to get the right place is really important. And I think it's also important to, you know, just plant trees anywhere. You plant them where, um, you know, one of the things the Woodland Trust is trying to do is, is to connect up different green uh, bits to make green highways for for the natural world for the for the animals to be able to move among and so to, so when you can connect that up rather than just having a clump here clump there it really makes a difference like an exponential difference rather than just the trees themselves it's other things get affected as well so I think it needs to be done um, with thought and care and responsibly. Absolutely. And uh, Jill has just said in the chat, accessibility to trees is so important. And that's always been true, but hopefully it's been brought home to more people over this last year, the pandemic. You know, there's some people have more access to trees and green space than others. And that's something that needs to be uh, addressed as well. We've got we've got quite a few questions in. If we, you're right to go on for a little bit longer, we're just going yeah, to we're, we're, we're OK if, if you are. Yeah. Uh, well, we're, I, I'm more than happy and we've got more than what we've got, 142 people still watching. So I think everybody's uh, everybody's happy. Um, and lots of people sharing their recommendations for tree books in the chat as well, which is yes, I'm just writing so them down. You can uh, you can request a copy of the chat later so you can still concentrate on the Tracy yeah. and John's answers. OK, let's have a if you want a sort of existential question, it's always good to turn to Mr. Anthony Mills and he hasn't disappointed this evening. Anthony says. For a world that is increasingly secular, do you think the extended life of trees and their larger than human life stature provides an avenue for the expression of spirituality and an extension of life beyond our own into a greater ecosystem? Anthony, uh, I love you. Anthony, you're leading. Come and I, have a drink with us, Anthony. <laughs> I think Anthony is leading the witness. Uh, would you, would you agree that? Uh, would you think My that, Lord. Yeah, yeah. I, this uh, is what Anthony does every week. I've got to tell Anthony, you. Well, well, done. well, bless you, Anthony. I, 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 I don't think we've met, but I, I want to meet you now. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, what, what, if I can paraphrase what I think you're saying, is that human beings need to understand that we're not the only thing around. Um, and that there might be something 
sort of bigger than us and more important than us. Um, and I couldn't agree more. Anthony, my answer to you is that um, I tend to write historical novels and people ask me why history is important. And the way I look at it is you can actually apply to trees too as well. Um, we, we, especially when we're kids and when we're growing up, we, are, we tend to live in the moment and we think about the we think about the moment we're living in and maybe the bit about the future, what we're gonna do. And I feel like as you get a little bit older, you start to appreciate instead of, you go from being the one dimensional in the, in the moment to thinking ahead. So that gives you a little second dimension there. But um, if you really wanna be a full rounded person, you look back too, because it, it gives you perspective and it gives you, um, it makes you not the dot or the line, but actually, well, it could be an extended line, but you could line out that way instead of straight. And you, um, it makes you into a more rounded person where you actually understand, have a better grasp of where, uh, of how, how small we are as individuals, which is actually can be a relief rather than thinking you're the center of the universe, you're not. And, um, and it's great to step off the center stage and to, and to acknowledge our ancestors and where we've come from, it makes you feel incredibly there. And, and trees do that by, you know, as I said before, you plant a tree and you don't, you know, so many people plant trees too close to their properties, their houses, because they just don't think about what it's gonna be like in 50 years and how it's too close. So all these trees are having to be taken down because of that. You know, you have to think ahead and, and to be forced to, think back like the tree has lived so much longer than you way before you and it's going to live way beyond you and I just think that's a, that's um I wouldn't go so far as to say it's religious or spiritual as you're kind of implying Anthony but I would um definitely say it makes us better people I, I would go as far as to say it's spiritual but the um uh, one of the things which is, I suspect, not the way you intended this uh, bit of conversation to go <laughs> uh, there's an interesting tree of Cameroon um, and Gabon uh, in West Africa called the Iboga. And one of the uh, ways that the tree is used is that the roots contain a, a sort of mind altering substance. Um, that in the context of the Bwiti culture um, makes people feel that they are connected to their ancestors and to their heirs. And uh, you know, it's, it's partly because of the mind altering substance and partly because of the context in which it's taken. Um, but that same uh, plant is actually being uh, turned into a, a sort of a, a chemical that can be used to wean people off heroin addiction in, in the West. But um, uh, I suspect that's probably not what the uh, uh, what you're intending with your question. I think an, another interesting side of that is something that you talked about earlier on, uh, John, about the sort of um, the quantification of benefits of trees and how that's very useful to be able to quantify the benefits but that you can't essentially quantify everything i think when you're talking about superstition and stuff as well and that that idea of uh, a sort of a spiritual experience it's very hard to put a monetary value on how you feel when you stand in front of a 2000 year old yew tree there's, you can't there's a put a value on that there is a, a sort of super super danger um that many others have commented on uh, in different fields that you know, you, you measure the things that are easy to measure. And then those are the things that become important because they're easy to measure and people have them in spreadsheets and all of that. You know, and you can see successive governments uh, of different colors doing this all the time, all over the world. You can see how we've done that with our education system. Um, you know, where I remember our son, Jacob, when he finished his GCSEs, said, what the hell was that about? Now I can get back to learning again. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, we, we, we do things which are easy to test rather than, um, uh, you know, and easy, easy to put a number on rather than necessarily being important. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I was, I was I'm going in a slightly different direction from that, but, but um, it's easy to measure how many trees you've planted less easy to measure how many trees you've saved. And I think we, we tend to forget that, um, you know, if you're talking about carbon sequestration, it's uh, a large mature tree takes in much more per year than a little sapling. And, and, and there is, it's really important to re that we, and, but it's not as measurable, it's not as sexy as planting and obvious as planting a new tree. That just sounds like, oh, we're doing something really great. But actually, what is really great is if you save that big old yeah. oak tree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. You can't can't count the trees that haven't been cut down, I guess. 
Um, so Anthony's asked that question. Well done, Anthony. But if anyone's going to out existential Anthony, it is my very good friend, Neville Fay, who has come in with a question that I'm going to ask. And it's my gift to you, Tracy and John. Thank you, Neville. Neville says, could we have had conceptual thought without our relationship to the tree? Which came first? <laughs> if you like Anthony, you'll love Neville. Well, uh, there, there is a way of taking your question, Neville, um, which is absolutely literally. And therefore, I will, because that, that gets us sort of off the hook. Um, and you know, human humankind. Um, you know, could we have survived without the products of trees, uh, and got to you know, sort of uh, got got to the stage of evolution that, that we're at? Um, uh, d debate, but the you know, we we've in order to grow as a civilization, we've had to domesticate a whole lot of things, including uh, including a bunch of grasses. Um, uh, what are the trees? Uh, given us, you know, a whole load of medicines, a whole load of, uh, you know, fruits and nuts and vegetables and, I mean, and, and um, things that we eat, clothing. Um, I, I know this is not what you intended, but I'm thinking that uh, without the tree species, um, we might have, we might have just about got off the ground. Uh, been, a, been a, a lot harder. But we don't know because the trees are always, were here before we were. And so we've all, we came into the world with them there already. And so we've adapted to that. What? Yeah, so it's it's impossible. Neville, you're just naughty. You're just naughty. That's just a crazy. crazy he is thing. naughty. No, we, Neville, we, I suspect he's also thinking about, and sorry to put words in your mouth now, but I'm thinking that uh, if to early humans, trees would have been the longest living things that they would have seen and I suppose maybe the length of the length the time span in which a tree is alive and unchanging may have then given some benchmark to well, human development or lifespans. Yeah maybe though um, you know I mean it does amaze me that uh, you know the the kind of measurements that that you know apparently illiterate people managed to do on astronomy um, which would have taken generations and generations in order to uh, make astronomical observatories. Um, this is sort of pretty, pretty stunning when you when you kind of think about it. Um, it's interesting, though, the whole idea of the the tree's lifespan is basically longer than ours, and it's it's um, affecting maybe Neville what you're saying and what you're saying, John, is that it's affecting how um, how we perceive time. And that's that's a big that's a big deal. And maybe maybe if there weren't plants or trees that lived longer than us, we would have a different sense of time. Is that what? Well, that's, yeah. well, that's what I was saying about astronomy. Yeah. That you know we, we we would have been still seeing things over many you know changing uh, uh, and coming back to the same point over many generations. So um, yeah, tricky tricky one. Yeah. See how quickly we get philosophical here. Sorry, we didn't, yeah, we didn't prepare you for this. It's good. They're good, aren't they? They're lovely, this stuff. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> um, okay, we've got a couple of questions. There's one that I'm partly going to answer, but then I will happily, obviously, share it with you because you're who people want to hear. Uh, Umi's asked about um, uh, most housing developments in London have no trees or nature design into their build. Who is responsible in councils uh, ensuring that trees and nature are part and parcel of any new housing developments? The reason I said I'd answer is purely because I think everybody needs to give huge kudos to the tree officer, uh, who is the person employed by local authorities to look after public trees and to sort of uh, oversee tree preservation orders and the like. And tree officers are fantastic people. They're hugely under-resourced. They need more support and more attention and more respect. They're the custodians of our urban trees and they're generally brilliant. So I would say that it's those people who are largely responsible to me, but they don't always have the resources to do what they know they need to do and what they want to do. So that's my answer. Tracy and John, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on any of these questions. A couple of things I, I would add is, you know, one, I, I would, um, you know, just harking back to Johnny Appleseed, you know, I, I would try and ensure that uh, tree planting um, uh, and tree custodianship is part of any new development. Um, but also I would uh, make sure that there is some part of the budget that is held back until the trees are established. And 
uh, you know, you see too many architects' drawings of beautiful sort of trees all planted around new developments, and somehow they never seem to quite happen that way. And so, um, you know, the, there should be an artist's impression, and then that's compared five years later, and then you release the rest of the money. I think the other thing is that it, it's um, you can say, well, the government should be doing this, the government should be doing that. But actually, the, another way into it is is to train architects and designers to um, to automatically think that uh, planting trees is as important and essential to to their plan uh, as as the buildings or the the plumbing, the sewage, whatever. Um, that, that trees should just be automatically a part of that. And maybe that comes down to training in architectural schools. The, the, the difficulty with that is that, um, you know, architects and planners are employed by someone. And, uh, you know, you, I think the, um, you know, it needs to follow the money, actually. So, of course, they need to be, um, you know, sort of educated in that way. But I think many of them are. Um, you know, the architects and planners that I speak to seem to have that knowledge. But... Uh, you know, if everything's down to a price and people get permission to go ahead on the basis of uh, designs which are cheaper, then, you know, unfortunately that wins out. Whereas if there were really strong financial incentives, um, uh, it, both incentives and disincentives to, to sort of operate in the wrong way, um, you know, that would, uh, you know, that would be helpful. Absolutely. Okay, look, we've got a couple of minutes left and we've got two more questions I reckon we'll squeeze in. One of them's a really nice one that I think I'll, I'll sort of aim at Tracy first because I think this was typed when you were uh, talking about propagation and um, apples and, and Johnny Appleseed and cuttings and the like. And um, Thomas has asked a question that I really like. Would you say stories are a good way to propagate trees? <laughs> yeah. They're a good way to propagate the ideas of trees. They don't literally propagate trees, but sure. I mean, if you could imagine somehow impregnating books with uh, with seeds and that you have to plant them that way, that would be. But no, I, I think definitely um, uh, trees, that, I think that's what this whole evening in some ways is about, is, is we're both storytellers. We're just coming at it from fiction and nonfiction, but those those um, that line is really blurred. I mean, I, I do a lot of research. John does tons of research and I do a lot of research for my book. So I, re, I you know, I tried to be as accurate as I could, although the people are made up. Certainly the the, the botany in, in, in at the edge of the orchard is not made up. And uh, so in that way, I think definitely uh, stories can can really um, teach us a lot about trees. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, well, you said it. I mean, that's why we're here. Um, they, that um, human beings are sort of pattern recognizing organisms. Um, and, in, in, you know, you, you could see that really what we're doing is transmitting patterns from one generation to the next in our DNA. But we ourselves recognize patterns even when there are none. Um, so give people a pattern, in other words, a story. Um, stories have a pattern to them or a series of patterns to them. People recognize those and then start caring. And so, um, yes, I would say that stories are a terrific way of propagating trees. And I, my, my sort of piece of advice, um, uh, and, and it comes from a, a lot of, you know, trial and error, <laughs> a lot of error, and uh, a, a lot of sort of quite humiliating research when I discovered what people were thinking of my television programs when I used to make them and, and, and what worked and what didn't, is that, um, you know, as scientists, you're often trained not to make things personal. You're usually told to write in passive language and to, um, you know, be dispassionate in every way. Um, but actually what changes minds is, is the heart and the soul. Lovely answers. Thank you very much. Well, let, let's follow on from that into our last question. Again, a seamless link. Um, and the last question is one that we, we often ask, uh, uh, well, we always ask our webinar presenters. It's our 45th webinar now, I think, 46th. And uh, we've, uh, we've had lots of great answers, but it seems even more appropriate than normal to ask it to our guests this evening. What is your favourite tree-related book? Tracy, you go first. Funny enough, I happen to have a prepared answer. Um, my favorite tree book is The Man Who Planted Trees by Jean Giono. Um, it was written, uh, Giono was a, a novelist. We worked in a bank and then he wrote novels. And he wrote this, um, it's basically a fable about um, 
uh, a, a man, he, he, this man comes across this shepherd who is uh, every day goes out and plants a hundred trees, hundred oak trees, acorns, and um, uh, in an area of southern France that's really barren, and nobody thinks they're going to grow. And then um, the, the the narrator comes back ten years later after World War One, and he sees this kind of gray haze on the hills, and it's the it's the oak trees. Uh, he, the guy plants ten thousand trees, and they're um, not all of them have survived, but a lot of them have, and they're they're growing and they're 10 years old. And then and now he's moved on to beech and birch and he's he plants and he he completely changes the ecology of the area because water comes back and people come back. And it's um it's about so really, I mean it's not a true story. Everybody thought it was true. They wanted to believe, they really wanted to believe, but it was it was um it was just a reminder of how trees can transform a landscape and a culture. Thanks, Tracy. Yeah, uh, I would pick um, uh, for, from nonfiction. I would pick *The Forest Unseen* um, by David George Haskell, um, and I, I think that what he did so brilliantly was just take uh, a, a, a meter square or a yard square of, of old-growth forest in the United States, um, and uh, just meticulously observe it, sort of in the tradition of Darwin. Um, and just uh, extrapolate from his observations uh, in all sorts of interesting directions. Um, and, and so I, I would say that that is uh, my favorite um, uh, nonfiction book. And then for fiction, uh, I would actually pick um, uh, Otto Pasolinen's book, Year of the Hare, um, which is about someone living in a forest uh, for a year, uh, Hare, H-A-R-E. Um, which is a sort of absolutely charming and enchanting uh, book from Finland. And I never realized that the Finnish have quite such a sense of finely tuned irony. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a sort of absolutely wonderful, uh, wonderful read. Great choice. I should say that the year of the hair, H-A-I-R, is probably nowhere near as interesting. That don't, no, <laughs> nobody, nobody go, don't waste your time reading that one. There's some great answers. Thank you. I should say, John, as well, let's put you on the spot. I think this is the first time we've had the author of a book that was selected as another presenter's favorite tree book, because a few weeks ago, one of our presenters said around the world in 80 trees as their favorite book. So there you go. So fantastic. Who, who was that? I wouldn't possibly name and shame who it was. You'll have to watch all the webinars and find <laughs> out who it was. <laughs> oh, oh, bless her or him. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, look, Thank you, uh, Tracy, John. That was absolutely brilliant. It was a really special webinar. Wonderful to be a part of. Thank you both so much. We really, really enjoyed it. Uh, Sophie's actually just sent you a link to a, a little catch up afterwards. So have a look at that if you so desire. Um, and thank you to everyone watching. You're all wonderful. Great questions. Great discussions. We really appreciate you coming. Um, I'd just like to stress again, you know, we do our webinars every week. This is a special joint event between the Arboriculture Association and the Urban Tree Festival. Please check out all of the other stuff the Urban Tree Festival is doing. They're doing some great stuff. Um, it's all online on their website, so please go and check it out. Join in the Urban Tree World Cup. Of course, you're all desperate to do it. Every day there's a game between now and the finals, the first week of June, I think. So get involved with that. And um, other than that, thank you both. Thank you, Sophie, for doing all the hard work behind the scenes. Thank you to our audience. And thank hopefully you. see you very soon. Thank you. We Bye -bye. love you all. We Bye -bye. love you all.